So thank you for joining this Keep Scotland Beautiful and Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency Session. Really to find out how climate change will impact the hospitality sector and the role of the Green Key Accreditation in helping your business attract more business and secure those vital environmental improvements and also to benefit from those cost savings. My name's Aileen Crawford. I'm the head of the Glasgow Convention Bureau, and I know I've been joined by some of my colleagues from the Bureau today as well. So it's lovely to have them with us virtually too. Um, we are so keen to support this event because climate emergency and the actions to be more sustainable at a city and a business level are really critical. Really critical to the success of Glasgow as both a tourism and a conference destination. Glasgow was the first city to join the U, to join the Global Destination Sustainability Index in 2016, and the city currently ranks fourth in the world of sustainable tourism and events destinations. We were also the first city uh, as a convention bureau to sign up to Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency in support of our People Make Glasgow Greener strategy. And that strategy is really there to help us win more conference business to Glasgow, but also to deliver sustainable conferences with our clients and for our delegates. As you know, public concern about sustainability is growing and many clients already consider the environmental performance when choosing their conference venue and their conference hotel. Visit Scotland research shows that this is also true when it comes to tourists choosing their destinations, choosing their accommodation and choosing their experiences. With Glasgow set to welcome COP26 in the autumn this year, the eyes of the world will be on our city and sustainable hospitality as never before. So now is our chance to get ready. So on that note, may I introduce you to the panel today? Uh, we're joined by Alistair Seaman, Keep Scotland Beautiful's Climate Change Manager. Alistair is an experienced environmental leader in the business and charitable sectors, both in the UK and internationally. Aoife Hutton is Climate Change Officer at Keep Scotland Beautiful, and Aoife leads the delivery of Green Key and climate emergency training for leaders in business, public and community sectors. We also have Jeremy Smith with us, the co-founder of Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency. And Jeremy coordinates the overall strategy and he's leading the development of three climate action plans, kind of blueprints for accommodation, for tour operators and destinations. And these will be launched at COP26. So Alistair, can we start with you? The tourism and hospitality and event sector we know has been really hard hit over the last year. So why should businesses be considering their sustainable credentials now? Why does it matter? Over to you, Alistair. Thank you, Aileen, and uh, thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, just before I begin, a very quick introduction to uh, Keep Scotland Beautiful for those of you who don't know us. Um, we are a national environmental charity in Scotland working on some of our most pressing environmental issues, a strong focus on climate change, which is our focus today, but also on two other issues which I think are, are quite relevant to your sector. Firstly, on tackling the challenges of waste and litter, but also on protecting and enhancing Scotland's places and their heritage. Um, but in the next few minutes, we are going to focus on the big question of the climate emergency. What is it? And why does it matter? And, and we're particularly aware of the challenges that your sector has been through and continues to face. So why do we believe that in this context, this is still something that you need to be thinking about and addressing? Well, you could go to university and you could do a four year degree in this, um, but we're gonna try and cover it off in a lunchtime. So it's gonna be pretty quick. It's gonna be pretty high level. Um, but our hope is that it'll give you a really good starting point for thinking and acting on this. And as Aileen has said, please put any questions that come to mind into the chat box and we'll try and pick them up in our question and answer session. So what is a climate emergency? Well, our planet is surrounded by a thin blanket of gases, what we call our atmosphere. And this blanket is all that protects you and me from the cold, harsh reality of outer space. Uh, this blanket regulates Earth's temperature and a lot of uh, life's important processes. And it's what makes life on Earth 
possible in our universe. Why the picture of the apple? Well, to illustrate that this layer of gas, our atmosphere is incredibly thin. It's similar in proportion to the earth as the skin is to an apple. Now, when, when we look up at the sky, we tend to see the atmosphere as being endless and going on forever. Um, but actually when we zoom out, we see it's very thin, it's quite fragile and it's very susceptible to change. And the reality is that human beings are changing the composition of that atmosphere, of that thin layer very significantly in two particular ways. Firstly, through burning fuel, and what we call fossil fuels, so coal, oil, gas, petrol, diesel, jet fuel, which results in carbon dioxide thickening that warming blanket around the earth. And although I've shown a picture here of an oil refinery, this could be a picture of a car or your gas cooker or your gas boiler or any factory that produces the goods and the items that we use and buy every day. And but secondly, the way we manage land is having a big um, impact on this little layer of gas. Um, through our farming methods, through the way we use and abuse land, so draining our peat bogs, uh, uh, removing our forests, but here in Scotland, particularly by our use of fertilizers and the gases produced inside the stomachs of sheep and beef and dairy cattle, uh, all of which release warming gases. And together, these um, gases are thickening this blanket around the earth, trapping, trapping the sun's heat and raising temperatures. And the obvious question you'll get asked in the pub is, isn't that a good thing? Wouldn't it be good for Scotland's tourism industry if we were a bit more like the south of France? The problem is that um, this warming represents a massive increase in energy in the Earth's weather system. So global warming since the Industrial Revolution over the last 150 years has released the equivalent of an atomic bomb's worth of energy into this system every single day. Um, sorry, every single second. So, so a huge buildup, a couple of degrees of heat doesn't feel like a lot when you're sitting in, in, in a jumper in Scotland today, but it represents a massive buildup of energy in the system. And this energy is leading to um, an increase in frequency and, and severity of extreme weather events. So in particular to catastrophic storms that destroy property and, and lives, to fires like those that we've seen increasingly in Australia, um, which the WWF estimated harmed uh, over 3 billion animals last year um, in California, and not just there, but um, we had huge significant fires in Ireland last month. And we're seeing an increase in flooding. And again, we're used to seeing that in faraway places, but it's coming here uh, to the UK. And think about, think about where you live. Think about Scotland cities. Almost all of our major centres of population in Scotland are at sea level. So Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Perth, Stirling, um, Inverness, all actually at sea level. Um, so this is something that our planners are increasingly having to wrestle with and a reality that we'll have to cope with. But paradoxically, in addition to floods, we'll see an increase in uh, drought events, uh, which will have knock-on impacts into food avail availability and to food shortages. Now, all of these are things that happen naturally. They're natural phenomenon. Uh, they kind of happen in a way, but climate change is increasing both the frequency of these events and also the severity of these disasters. So these are perhaps the things that we can kind of understand fairly readily as being an impact of a warming climate. But in addition to, uh, into the, to these natural disasters, climate change is leading to a number of other things that we should be concerned about. It's all of this is going to have an impact and is already having an impact on infrastructure. Like, for example, the tragic, Stone, the tragic Stonehaven trail derailment that resulted in loss of life here in Scotland last year. Um, railway rails are buckling in heat. Electric wires are sagging in heat. Landslides are closing roads and blocking trains. And last year, my community and the community next to me both lost our um, access to our GP practices phones, their phone systems went down uh, after significant flooding. So things that we just kind of take for granted as you know, being able to pick up the phone and speak to our GP are being disrupted. Um, it will have an impact on our buildings. Again, I'm based in Clat Manager and our local Tesco in Stirling had to close. The roof couldn't cope with the intensity of rainfall. It poured through uh, the roof into the store, destroyed a huge amount of, um, of goods and led to that store being closed for a long period of time and significant loss of revenue to that business. Um, many of our offices will struggle uh, to stay cool enough in, in the hot weather and will overheat. Um, it's going to lead to an impact on health. Um, excuse the barking dog if you can hear in the background. <laughs> um, the Lancet Medical Journal has described climate change as being the single biggest threat to human health directly from the disasters we've talked about, but also from the impact it's going to have on increases to pests and diseases 
And again, that's not just a faraway issue. Um, in Scotland, we're seeing uh, the rise of ticks and an increase in tick-borne diseases. Um, and that actually is something that is already going to have an impact on the tourism industry here in Scotland. Um, it's going to lead to an increase in food, per in food prices, uh, challenges to food production. And again, food is a very important part of your business, as well as a massive issue for those who are already struggling to pay for their food bills. It's going to have an impact on nature, um, very, very significant um, nature challenges. And I think this text in red says it all. We tend to think that nature is something out there and separate to us. We forget that actually we're eroding the very foundations on which our economies and our businesses are actually built. And here in Scotland, our national agency, Nature Scott, believe that climate change is the single biggest threat to uh, nature in Scotland. And if you think, well, that's something for someone else to worry about. Um, they've also carried out some research looking at the importance of nature on the tourism industry in Scotland. So very, very significant uh, degree of tourist spend is linked to the quality of our natural environment. It's going to have an impact on our water quality, the quality of our marine environment, on our rivers. That will knock on into impacts for drinking and washing, our fishing industry, but again to angling tourism, which is, again is quite a significant part of our uh, tourism industry here. And finally, and interestingly, uh, it's going to impact on our historic landmarks and landscapes. Historic Environment Scotland, Scotland's agency for our, our historic environment, are deeply concerned about the impact of climate change in a number of ways. So, for example, if you think about Scarra Brae and Orkney, perhaps our most precious natural um, or historic monument, Europe's oldest preserved habitation, right at sea level, um, at, at risk from increasing storms and rising sea levels. But um, uh, archaeologists are worried about the, uh, the impact of drying soils on foundations of old buildings, their ability to cope with the changes that are ahead. This is all in Scotland, but if we look globally, we know that climate change is already leading to significant loss of life, which is knocking on into exacerbating conflicts, violence and human migration as food and water become less available. And the stark reality is that those who've done the least to cause the problem are already suffering the most. That's true around the world, but it's also true in Scotland. So you may not know, but in Scotland today, around 2000 people every year die prematurely because of air pollution, uh, which is, is very linked to climate change. Uh, those people are those who live in the most air polluted areas. They're, they're generally poor. And there's a growing recognition that the issue of the climate crisis is closely linked to some of the other big crises we face, including the racial and gender justice crisis. So, for example, a study in the US found that people in the US who die of heat stroke are predominantly poor and are predominantly people of color. Those whose homes are at greater risk from flooding or landslides, whether that's in Glasgow or Buenos Aires, are poor. These are people who generally don't have cars, don't fly, can't even afford to heat their homes. They generate very little of these gases and they suffer the most. It's, it's, a, it's a significant justice issue. So the challenge is, what do we do about it? Well, we know there's growing public support in Scotland and around the world for ambitious action, that it's time to stop tinkering at the edges and take radical action. Scientists tell us we have to strive to keep the rises to below one and a half degrees, which they think could stop the most serious damage. But for all the recent commitments and innovations, including the election of Joe Biden and China's recent commitments, we're nowhere near that. We're still on track for at least two and a half degrees of warming. So there's a long way to go yet. Here in Scotland, our government has committed to tackling <coughs> climate change quite radically. They've introduced their own targets to end our contribution to warming by 2045. So you'll hear this phrase net zero. What that effectively means is we're no longer contributing to global warming. And that is going to mean, hu mean huge changes in the way that we do life in Scotland. And here are some of the big ones to look out for. We're already changing how we generate energy uh, as we stop burning fuels to make electricity and use clean renewable sources. And Scotland has actually made some great progress on that. But we are going to have to more than double our generation capacity because and um, we're going to need that clean energy in future to warm our homes, to power our transport in a way that uh, we don't currently. Um, it's going to lead to very significant changes to how we heat our buildings, including our hotels, our restaurants. Um, from 2024, you will no longer be allowed in Scotland to put a gas boiler into a new house and some other categories of buildings. We're going to be using new technologies, particularly heat pumps, as you see in this picture here. And your sector, much of your sector is going to have to adopt this new technology in the, in the coming years. The government reckon we need to, um, half of Scotland's homes need to have this technology in the next 10 years if we're going to meet our targets. So this is a big change coming quite quickly. We're going to have to change what we eat 
The government's advisory committee on climate change say we need to reduce meat consumption by 20% in the next decade and 35% by 2050. So again, very significant uh, implications for your sector. We're gonna change how we travel. There will be fewer international flights. Clear uh, imp impact on your sector. We'll be moving to electric vehicles. Again, from 2030, there will be no new petrol or diesel cars sold in the UK. Guests will need charging infrastructure. And um, when they're coming to your facility, they'll be looking for e-bikes and bikes and safe routes to use them when they come and stay at your place. And we're going to be moving to a zero waste economy. We're going to be ending our throwaway culture and, and very significantly uh, restricting the use of single use items, which again ha has historically been uh, an important part of the tourism and hospitality sector. So in the last few minutes, I just want to flag up what I think some of the key risks and opportunities climate change will present uh, to your sector and things that you as leaders need to be thinking about now. And I'm start, going to start with this quote from, uh, from Mark Carney. So don't take this from me, but take it from a pillar of the UK business uh, establishment. Um, what are the risks? Well, uh, hopefully you've picked up on, on what some of those are likely to be. I think it's helpful to think broadly in three categories. I think you need to be thinking about your market. So your market is changing, their preferences and their consumption patterns are changing. And your future European market is striking from school about this now, and they will want tourism experiences that reflect their strong environmental values. And, and as Aileen said, that's already happening. Visit Scotland research um, shows us that um, North European visitors increasingly are feeling guilty about getting on a plane and coming to Scotland. And if they're going to do that, they're going to want to see some very strong environmental content. They're going to want to have an environmentally responsive, responsible experience when they get here. And um, so we need to be thinking about the market changing. And if Scotland isn't offering that, then they'll go elsewhere. Um, I think you need to be thinking about your buildings and technology. Will your buildings be fit for purpose? Many of our most beautiful and iconic um, hotels um, are Victorian era or older. Um, but you also need to be ready for the new technology that will heat those buildings. And if you're going to be replacing or significantly upgrading your buildings in the next few years, then you need to understand where technology is going and be ready for that. And be careful that you don't bake in yesterday's technology, which will soon become expensive and redundant. And then I think thirdly, it's helpful to think about the policy, legal and taxation environment, which is changing very, very rapidly. There's hardly a month goes by without a significant new development here in Scotland. And you as business leaders, I think, need to keep an eye on that and not wait for these things necessary to land and become law, but to look down the line and see what's coming and start to do your preparation work now. And a question that we've often explored with leaders in, in the recent year is, if you knew COVID was coming two years ago, what might you have been able to do to prepare? And I would just encourage you to think of climate change as a very significant change that's already happening and will continue to happen, but you have noticed, we know this is coming. Now is the time for you to see what's coming and to get ready. But what about the opportunities? Because uh, as business leaders, as entrepreneurs, um, we're always looking for an opportunity. And, and in any difficult context, there's also an opportunity. And here's Carney again, reminding us of this. So what are those opportunities? Well, in some ways, they're flip sides of the challenges. Um, but here's the big one, um, the growth in the market for environmentally responsible tourism um, is a huge opportunity. And if you're not offering that opportunity, then your competition will be, that's for sure, whether um, that's the next city or whether that's your competition where you are or whether it's another country. And Scotland must make sure that we're at the head of the pack here and exploiting this new market opportunity. And um, there's an opportunity here for uh, a financial saving or to stop losing money. Waste wastes. So whether that's heat leaking out of a poorly insulated building or whether you're running an old and expensive heating system or whether you're throwing food in the bin or whether single use plastics are being landfilled, and you have an opportunity to close the loop to reduce the amount of money uh, that you're losing currently by ad adopting uh, these measures. There's opportunities for uh, producing your own energy. Many um, tourism and hospitality ventures have uh, land, have significant buildings with roofs that can generate additional revenue streams and or produce energy at significantly lower rates than you can buy it in the market at the moment. And um, worth thinking too, I think about staff recruitment and talent and retention. I know that uh, your industry has particular challenges there, but the future workforce in Scotland will want to work for employers that take this issue seriously. And if you want the best staff in your team, then you need to be moving on this agenda. And then I think finally, 
it's worth just reminding ourselves that actually many of these changes that we're going to take are going to be good for Scotland, good for people, good for our communities, good for our health. So whether that's an end to fuel poverty because we've finally got properly insulated homes, whether that's cleaner air because we're taking these <clears throat> and diesel and, and petrol cars off the roads, uh, greener cities, healthier diets, more active lifestyles, a richer natural world. And interestingly for Scotland, the government's banking on this. Many of these changes will require new skills and new jobs, uh, new green jobs that can't easily be automated, can't be offshored. So there's a potential economic win for our country here. So this, in many ways, I think is, is if not the one of the defining issues for our generation as a generation of leaders. And the question, of course, is what are we going to do about it? And I'm just going to leave you with this slide. How will you answer the question that future generations will ask when they ask you what role you played in tackling the emergency? So I hope I've kind of set some context there and to get us going. But I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to um, my colleagues. I think it's Jeremy who's up next and then Aoife. Thank you. Thank you very much there, Alistair. And that, that's got us thinking very much about where we sit, because those on the, on the call today, we rely very heavily on tourism and events to bring people to our destination and as you said there it's to bring people to Glasgow responsibly and sustainably and I know we've got everybody on the call today is looking at how we do that and is, is behind that message all the way and I suppose that's where you come in Jeremy because you've you've taken this on as the tourism and events industry and, and you're leading the charge to, to have us communicate that and understand it and work together and collaborate on that. So over to you to tell us more about Tourism Declares. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen, which I hope is now being shared. I'll just open it up properly. Anyone can see my screen okay? Um, all good. Um, thank you very much. I am co-founder of Tourism Declares Climate Emergency, tourismdeclares.com. I'm just going to give you a short introduction to what we do. Thankfully, Alistair has very much given the full detailed introduction to the challenges and the opportunities facing tourism in particular. <clears throat> so we launched Tourism Declares in January of 2020. And of course, in January 2020, the conversation was very much not around COVID, but within, and we launched with 14 founder signatories, all coming together, declaring a climate emergency and making a shared set of commitments. And those commitments were that we needed to focus tourism's response to the climate emergency and base it in science and come together to have a shared alignment around what has become an increasingly understood global commitment to halve um, emissions by 2030 in order to stand the best chance of reaching net zero before 2050 and keeping warming as Alistair was explaining at a global level within 1.5 degrees and all of those companies from the very beginning when they declared those first 14 committed to publishing a plan for what they would do a climate action plan within 12 months of declaring now today we are just about at 250 it says 245 on the website but there's four or five more just being processed through so we're at 250 companies and organizations who have made that shared commitment and come together and they represent every single sector of the industry when the last five are put on we have our first cruise company on board we have an airline in there we have large companies small companies consultants accommodation, destinations, tour operators, travel agents, digital bloggers, you name it, from all over the world, over 50, I think it's 55 countries have represented in terms of the headquarters and of course many hundreds of countries in terms of where the visitors go with the various tour operators, etc. that come together through us. And it doesn't matter whether companies are some of the leaders known across the world for their work on sustainable tourism or companies who are just know they've got to do something and beyond that have a blank sheet of paper. So long as we all come together with the shared understanding and shared commitment to do what the science says and to find our place in that action, the very purpose of tourism declares is to be a broad church for everyone to come together 
and to work together and to share our challenges and to build solutions that we can share. And I don't say this to all the countries who I'm lucky enough to get the chance to talk to. I say it very sincerely and very honestly to Scotland. It is a great privilege and an honour to be able to say this to you and to come back to the, uh, sorry, virtually, but to come back to the city where I spent my university days. But Scotland truly is leading the way. Um, Visit Scotland in November last year was the first national tourism organisation in the world to declare a climate emergency coming on from the Scottish government, being the first government in the world to do so. Green Key is the first certification body in the world to declare a climate emergency with Keep Scotland Beautiful facilitating and managing it here in Scotland. And as Eileen had said, Glasgow Convention Bureau, the world's first convention bureau to declare. But many other organizations and companies, which hopefully I've captured you all here and I've missed anyone off, I apologize hugely. Um, but as you see, you have city focused tourism, you have wilderness, you have walking tours, you have accommodation, you have Sales Scotland, Wild Scotland, a whole range of different businesses of different sizes and different approaches. And with every one that comes together, working as part of that, Scotland's own community of responsible, sustainable tourism companies working together, sharing challenges, sharing commitment is strengthened. Our resilience is strengthened when we work together. And that is very much the principle under which Tourism Declares is built. We're built there to support one another through partnership. And we do this in various ways. We have anyone who declares, when someone declares for their company, anyone who works for their company, their entire staff is then welcome to be a member of the community platform that we have, a website, a private website, where anyone who has declared can connect with anyone else who has declared. You're, it's there for people to ask questions, to come together, to share their stories. We host webinars on it, we share resources, but it means that you know that anyone who is there has made the same commitments. No one's gonna sort of just suddenly, you know, pile on in a sort of social media way because you acknowledge that you've got a challenge or you're finding this part of it hard. It's there because we're all in it together. We also have mentors. We've set them up already for tourism, sorry, for tour operators, for accommodation, for destinations. And these are mentors from organizations who have published their climate action plans and who are leading the way in their sector. So that when someone joins, another accommodation business joins, they're connected with the mentor, explained what it is we're doing, seek, you know, to seek advice and connect them to others and to help them with the need, you know, their efforts to create their climate action plans. We have three expert working groups, again, for tour operators, accommodation, and for destinations. And in each one of those working groups, companies, organizations from across the world at different scales who are doing you know, sort of industry standard leading stuff around climate action are coming together to share their methodologies, work with one another, swap ideas, swap challenges, to know that while one of them might have solved one problem, then another one has solved another. And in the end, no one wins in climate unless we all work together. We have, you know, the race is one that we all actually must win together. And finally, we bring all of this together, as was mentioned, to publish blueprints which for climate action, for accommodation, for tour operators, and for destinations. Over the last 12 months, slightly longer, when COVID has focused all of our attention across this industry, across society, we've seen how, as people look to recover and rebuild after COVID, what they need is support, what they need is guidance. And so when, rather than saying you're on your own, to, when you look to publish a climate action plan, we're working with everyone, bringing together experts, sharing each other's experiences, to design these blueprints for what climate action for our industry should look like, which, as Eileen mentioned, we will be having ready to be public in time for COP26. So just as my final slide, this is just to say that we're building towards November and towards COP26. And there's two things in particular that we're doing. We're about to launch in the next couple of weeks a questionnaire that will be being spread across the global industry and certainly spread across Scotland. We've been working with the UNWTO on this and had input from all sorts, including Visit Scotland. And it's, excuse me, basically a questionnaire mapping climate action in tourism. 
to truly understand where we are, what is it we're doing, what is it we're finding hardest, what tools are we using, what best practice have we got, so we really get the richest, most inclusive and representative picture of what is happening so that we can use that to guide the, con the creation of our blueprints. And then come November, we're working with the UNWTO, with Visit Scotland, with the United Nations Environment Programme and the Travel Foundation based in Bristol, southwest of England, all of us together to co-host some events at COP26 where we will bring together the tourism industry to chart together what our plans are for how we will, as an industry together, play our part in climate action, both respond to the responsibility and also seize the opportunities that Alistair alluded to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And it is really exciting for us and our city. It's six months to go until the, the conference. And we had the COP president just outside Glasgow. It looked like it was White Lee's wind farm, the largest wind farm in Europe. He was talking this morning about that live face-to-face -face event. So thank you for, for bringing all that together and having the Glasgow COP as your launch. We're delighted about that. So after the, the introductions and the, the practical examples that Jeremy's offered, it's our turn now to welcome Eva on to welcome and talk to us all Eva about what can we do practically? You know, we're here, we're enthusiastic, we're keen to get involved. How can we do this? Wonderful, thanks Eileen and welcome everyone to this webinar. Great to see so many people here from such a range of organizations. So building on what, what my uh, the previous two speakers have said, what I'm going to do now is focus in a bit more on Green Key, which is uh, one particular option to look at in terms of tangible action to take forward, um, especially in preparation for COP26 coming to Glasgow later this year. Um, and as Aileen said, we've now had confirmation that that will be uh, an in-person event. So uh, lots of exciting announcements uh, over the last couple of weeks in that regard. So Green Key is a, one example of an eco label. And um, I'm going to talk a bit around why um, why we, we Keep Scotland Beautiful um, have been really interested to bring this offering to Scotland. Now it is an international eco label that's been going for over 25 years and has a very broad international reach. But just to zone out a little bit first, to introduce eco labels in general, why should you, as a hospitality or tourism establishment, consider an eco label? Um, and now more than ever, first of all, it, it brings that element of trust and third party verification, that uh, additional um, outsider view to look at what you're doing um, and, and give some guidance on that, and also to celebrate the efforts um, that you're making with regards to sustainability. Eco labels also provide a frame for sustainability, um, a framework of best practice, different areas to focus on, and really a direction to use going forward over the next number of years. As Alistair's also mentioned, there's some real cost savings, and that's one of the co benefits of the different types of climate actions that we can all take. Waste is waste, um, as Alistair said, and many of the actions um, going forward although may involve an upfront investment, um, do ultimately lead to not just carbon savings, but also financial savings. Acknowledgement and celebration, also a really important aspect of all of this in terms of your own staff engagement too, and really rewarding the positive pro-environmental behaviors that we're seeing more and more of. So alongside that change in consumer habits around Scotland and, and the wider um, market, we're also seeing that change in staff attitudes and really important to acknowledge, celebrate and encourage that type of initiative around sustainability. And lastly, we have of course the changing markets and really it's about getting ahead of the curve on this and responding to that change that we're already seeing and we expect will continue to be more and more of a factor in people's um, choices of accommodation or tourism attractions. So Green Key in particular, as I mentioned, it's an international eco-label um, with a large global reach for tourism facilities. It's been going over 25 years um, across 65 countries now, um, so involving 3,200 establishments. In terms of who it's open to, there's a range of 
different categories Green Key is open to. So it started off being um, an eco label specifically um, aimed towards hotel accommodation, but now it's branched out to include many other categories. So we're also engaging with smaller accommodation, um, whether that's b bs hostels or others, campsites and caravan parks, conference centres, restaurants and also attractions. And that includes a full range of attractions, whether it's um, wildlife parks, distilleries, museums, any sort of attraction also falls into that. And the really nice aspect of Green Key as well is what we have is a separate criteria set for each of these categories. So the, the criteria that you're working towards in terms of your sustainability plans have been designed specifically for that category of um, establishment. A bit of background to Green Key. Now it's a, as I said, an international program um, and the ownership of that program lies with an organization called FEE. Now they're the Foundation for Environmental Education and they're known worldwide for a number of educational um, programs focusing on environments. So they also um, own the Eco Skills program, which some of you may be aware of. Um, and that is another program managed in Scotland by Keep Scotland Beautiful. And we've got a really positive engagement uh, with many schools across the country through Eco Schools. So on a similar vein, what Green Key does is really combine that education aspect into the award. So not just environmental management, but also looking at how you engage with your staff and customers around the actions that you're taking. So there's a lot of um, emphasis in this award around the communication piece too and the leadership shown. So FEE own the program globally, but it's run in each um, participating nation by what's known as a national operator. And in Scotland, Keep Scotland Beautiful are the national operator. It's also run by our partners um, around the UK in each of the nations. So why Green Key in particular? It's a really high quality eco-label with high standards in terms of the criteria used across um, the Green Key uh, categories. Those criteria are recognized by the UN Environment Programme, UN World Tourism Organization, and also meet the Global Sustainable Tourism Council standard. So in terms of the standards, what we're seeing is a lot of larger um, hotel brands in particular choosing Green Key to be their, their best practice um, eco-label to strive for across their estates. It's also run by um, charities in each of the um, each of the operating nations. So as a result of that, um, this eco-label is not um, being driven from a profit incentive. Um, there is a, a fee involved, but it's very much cost recovery. Um, it's a dialogue-based program with 20 years of experience. So there's that um, ongoing communication between national operators around the world. We meet regularly and share best practice example between those 65 different nations. And as a result of that, we have a constant review of those criteria as well. So it changes with the times. Green Key is endorsed by a number of in institutional partners and hotel chain partners um, around the world, as well as corporate partners. And I've shared just some of these on the screen today. In terms of the criteria, Green Key is looking at 13 different areas. So as I mentioned, we've got quite a bit in there around the staff engagement, involvement and communication to your customers. And then we've also got the more environmental management aspects um, of the criteria. So things like your water management, your energy management, and each of these criteria areas provides a frame um, for improvement of your sustainability. The other thing I'll point out about Green Key is it's um, this framework for constant improvement. So in your first year, um, what we're expecting to see is complying with the essential criteria of the award and then year on year um, you meet, meet more and more of the best practice criteria so it um, allows that direction for continual improvement over a number of years. A couple of examples from around the world, um, although we can't travel just now, nice to share some images from maybe some places more exotic. So this is a, a Hilton Hotel in Puerto Rico and um, this is in their first year of Green Key, they managed to have a cost saving of 10% of the energy bill just by some behavior changes that they were able to implement with the guidance of Green Key. So that was just around putting signage around the hotels and in guest rooms. So a huge cost saving um, immediately in place in, in that particular hotel. 
a couple of other examples we've also seen um, in Finland some really good communication with customers that has come back with some positive feedback um, from those consumers particularly around food um, that hotel has taken an interest in how that is communicated with the customers the local labeling of food available in the restaurant a little bit around the process of Green Key, if you are interested in looking into this. Initially, there is a desk based application. So you'll fill out um, a form against the criteria, send that off to us, and our team will give you some feedback on that criteria. Going from there, um, once everything's in order, we would then arrange an on site audit to come out um, and inspect your site. Following that, the decision ultimately goes to our national jury. We've got a wonderful national jury involved with Green Key in Scotland with representation from University of Stirling 2050 Climate Group, SEPA and Scottish Enterprise. So while we conduct the audits, the ultimate decision goes to the national jury. So there's that additional third party verification involved in this process as well. The award is renewed each year and you will update um, on your action plans to indicate to us uh, which additional criteria you're working towards. Just to tie back in with what was said earlier about COP as well, I mean, we're definitely expecting a huge uh, surge of interest in the city around sustainability. So looking back at some of the previous COP conferences um, around Europe, um, and apologies for the, the typo there on the second bullet point, but COP15 in 2009 in Copenhagen, um, that led to a huge surge of the interest of eco labels in the city. And the legacy impact of that is now over one in four hotels in Denmark now hold an eco label. COP21 in Paris in 2015, the official COP21 booking system um, was using eco certified accommoda uh, accommodations as the top recommendation for those uh, delegates booking onto accommodation. So it'll be really interesting and the lead up to COP and the legacy afterwards in Glasgow to see what that long term change will look like for the sector. A couple of other points before we wrap up into a couple of questions. Um, the other thing that keeps Scotland beautiful have been increasingly offering um, to businesses in Glasgow has been our climate emergency training. We know that that staff engagement piece is crucial to all this and to build in that staff, staff awareness for the changes, changes in sustainability that you want to make. So our training helps people understand the climate emergency, respond to the risks, opportunities and responsibilities ahead. So if you've enjoyed this webinar today, we do offer um, bespoke webinars or indeed longer training solutions. So feel free to get in touch with us if that training may be of interest to your organization. If you'd like to find out more about Green Key, Tim will pop um, a link into the website, or you can also contact me directly. Um, if you email greenkey at keepscotlandbeautiful.org, that will come to me and I'll be very happy to take any inquiries about the scheme. That's great, Eva, thank you very much. And we can now move to a few questions to the, the guests. And, and if I wanted to come to you because that accreditation is really fundamental to our ranking on the Global Destination Sustainability Index. Any third party accreditation is given a lot of, of points and it's, it's well recognised. But I know the businesses are very keen to, to share their stories. And as you were saying there, it's very much this journey that the businesses go on. So do Green Key actually help businesses understand how to improve their sustainability alongside the badge of honour in, in some way? Yeah, absolutely, Aileen, thanks for that question. So all of our criteria are available on the website and perhaps Tim can pop in a link to that. And we've got some really, really good guidance documents through those criteria, which will essentially help you uh, move towards meeting those different aspects. And even if you don't go for the award, um, it's a really good starting point just to think about those 13 different areas across your establishment and give yourself a bit of a health check on those. Um, we're also available on a consultancy basis if people wanted some one-to-one -one support um, in the lead up to that um, accreditation process. 
looking at that process itself, um, there's also that feedback built into it. So once we receive your application, we would come back with any feedback at that stage. And then the on-site audit from our expert auditors um, would also uh, bring in some recommendations at that point too. So it's very much not just to come in uh, and, and give you the rubber stamp, but there's a bit of um, hand-holding throughout that process as well and um, bringing in our expertise in that area. That's great, Eva. thank you very much. We had a question for, for Alistair. Alistair, as part of your presentation, you mentioned a reduction in the number of international flights. And I'm sure if we all had our cameras on, you'd have seen lots of eyebrows raising at that comment. So Greg from the GCU Glasgow Caledonian University has asked, what, what makes you think that those international flights are going to decrease? Is that something that consumers will just not travel as much or is this something that you see in legislation why do you think that might happen thanks elaine and thanks for asking the question it's a great question and i kind of threw that in to raise some eyebrows i wanted to make sure that you weren't all asleep um i mean the honest answer is nobody really quite knows uh, what's going to happen with um uh, with uh, with flights and there's a whole range of views and perspectives on that from you know bullish airlines who are promising new technology and offsetting and it'll just be fine and you know, in fact, we can accelerate the number of flights and see that grow through to people at the opposite end who say that's just completely inconsistent with, with trying to meet our targets. I think, so, so we don't really know, but coming back to the question, I think what's interesting here in the UK is that within the last year, the UK government has, has led a kind of citizens, they call it a citizens assembly around climate change, and we've done one in Scotland too. So fairly thorough processes where we've taken a representative sample of the British public given them an opportunity to explore this issue in detail and ask their, their views on, on, a number of, on a number of topics. And of course, travel and air travel has come up. So I have in front of me here, thanks for the heads up, the, um, the report from the UK Climate Assembly on air travel. And I'll stick a link to this in the chat, but 80% of assembly members strongly agreed or agreed that taxes uh, should increase as people fly more and as they fly further and saw those taxes as a fair alternative to policy options. So, um, you know, no government really likes to introduce tax rises, but the message interestingly from both the, the UK assembly and the Scottish assembly is that, is that the, 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 the people of Scotland and the UK um, would be very supportive of, of taxes on flights um, and particularly taxes that penalize those who fly further and who fly more frequently. Um, and of course, is that going to impact kind of business flying more than it will tourism flying and um, possibly and um, there's a lot we don't know here but but certainly I think I think you know governments have asked those questions of their citizens because they want to explore that that option um, and that's certainly something I think to 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 be aware of as possibly on the horizon so I'll put the link into that more detailed report uh, and, and those of you who are interested can follow that up. Hey, thanks, Alistair. That's most kind. Benjamin has got a question here for Jeremy. I think, Jeremy, you've noticed a few of your, your signatories are on the call. So I noticed that Frank very kindly put in a link to, to all the actions he's been doing with Downtown Map. So thank you for doing that, Frank. That's very interesting. Um, the Paris, you were saying there with the, the 1.5 degrees it being unachievable and the 2.5 being more realistic, Benjamin's asking, do you think then the tourism industry is in a degrowth, a decline? What do you think about our industry moving forward in the future? I think we, I think from what Alistair said and from the general context, we need to look at a different form of growth. I think that we will see certain aspects decline either, you know, um, involuntarily because climate changes mean that certain destinations become less visitable through temperature changes or the you know, reduction in coastlines or the loss of coral reefs, that in itself will be a forced form of degrowth. At the same time, opportunities for other forms of tourism will most likely expand. And we certainly, you know, we've seen over the last year or so, this sort of yearning to get closer to nature and to find isolation and to find opportunities to be restored and regenerated. And if that opportunity to, for a more sort of honest and closer connection with nature and the sort of thing that obviously Scotland has oodles of to sort of offer, then that becomes a growth. So I, I mean, I think I would prefer to see it in a more complicated way that some things will inevitably and some things will necessarily decline, but other things 
will have an opportunity to change. The notion that we as a species will cease our desire to wander and to visit and to rest and to travel, which is, you know, for the origin of how we got where we are, that's never going to go away. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And I know that the team of Visit Scotland on the call are very much promoting that responsible tourism and responsible travel. And I think we here at the Convention Bureau understand that res responsible travel messaging around staying longer, work, going to visit places that use the local food, local hospitality, trying to avoid that tourism leakage issue and being able to articulate that to delegates or event attendees, visitors coming to show that we understand that they're looking for a destination that can help them be as sustainable when they visit as they are at home. Um, a question that's come in, um, Isabel, for yourself from David, wondering about the green key accommodation provider, providers. Are they listed on a dedicated website which visitors can use? Um, how, is that, how is that being promoted, I suppose? So, the visitor will be inclined to book with um, a hotel provider that has gone through the accreditation with you. Yeah, great question. Thanks for that, David. Um, yes, so the Green Key International um, website has a, a full international database of all of the establishments. And because of that relationship that we do have with the um, Foundation for Environmental education at that level and um, they're in a number of um, conversations with various online booking platforms and um, I know that there's been a trial recently with booking.com and um, to get green key listed um, as a specific filter and there's those ongoing um, conversations we also have a very good relationship um, and partnership with visit scotland and um, so again that is something that we are actively exploring with them thank you very much Eva. Jeremy, can I come to you about a question that sort of bamboozles me? Uh, and that's around the, the net zero and the carbon emissions. And we've noticed that, especially over this last year, it's the reduction of carbon emissions that the governments, both national and, and local, are talking about. When it comes to a business, that seems quite a difficult thing to understand and to measure. But everybody says you can't manage what you, what you don't measure. So how do visitors understand what their carbon emissions are and understand how they've managed to reduce it? Um, because of not wanting to use up the last six minutes entirely with the long answer, um, I'll give the shorter answer, which is that it's, it is most definitely complicated and that the blueprints that we are developing, a core focus of that is to demystify and to provide the best advice possible around measurement for accommodation for tour operators for destinations <clears throat> and the challenge mostly is around working out what is your responsibility and what is beyond your level of responsibility and that is there are tiered levels of responsibility depending upon how much you cause it and how much influence you have over it for accommodation it's possibly it is simpler, let's say, than it is for a tour operator and certainly than it is for a destination. But nonetheless, it's still complicated. We are working with an organisation that was involved in the Hotel Carbon Measurement Initiative, which is the standard Hotel Carbon Measurement Initiative. Um, and we're working with them towards having a methodology for measuring around a net zero accommodation methodology ready to be part of our blueprints that will then be there at COP. And that would be so the accommodation focused part of it. I think that'd be very helpful just to keep us all on track. And just as we're coming to the end there, keeping an eye on the time, a question for Alistair, because we're talking about the businesses and businesses understand the role and remit and requirement to consider the health and safety, to consider licensing and legislation in their businesses. Do you think that sustainability and the green credentials will become very much part of that business planning in the future, Alistair? Um, I think in, in short, yes, in, in, in two ways. So there will be, as we're seeing already, an increasing um, number of businesses just doing that voluntarily because they recognize the business positives that will come from that. And they just see that as why sensible business planning. They want to capture the, the cost savings we've talked about. They want to be able to demonstrate to the market. 
But I think I think there has been a growing um, a growing uh, legislative requirement for large businesses in particular, and, and that's already there. So you know, if you have a big a particular turnover or particular staffing size, so you know, big big um, hotel chains already be caught up in this. They already have a legal requirement to report on their carbon footprint, for example. Um, and we can see, you know, as the years progress, we can see, you know, initially, you know, very high level large companies, but as the years go by. Um, these um, these are being lowered to capture to capture SMEs increasingly. And um, for interesting, Mark Carney, who I mentioned, um, worked uh, with um, with um, the, the international finance sector now to look at uh, there is a there is a forthcoming mandatory requirement for anyone who's who's um, for example um, on the stock market to declare and what they're doing on 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 the on the climate uh, and this is really interesting so the, the 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 push for that is not just because they want to see large companies being more environmentally responsible but it's also because they recognize that there I've talked about risks well if you're a shareholder you need to understand what those risks are you know so if this business is investing in technology that's going to disappear in 5 years time then you know your money could disappear um, so it's interesting that from the environmental sector but also the kind of the more money minded capitalist sector and um, there's an increasing drive to for businesses to really be clear and open and honest and transparent about their environmental performance and that's only going to get more and more significant yeah thank you very much alistair there's a question in Aoife about the costs for the accreditation can i presume that they are on the website or they can be sent to those interested yeah costs are on the website uh, tim can put that structure up but happy to, to answer that now as well so we we divide it up into two costs. So there's the kind of the up to the audit point, and then there's a, an annual fee if you are successful. So up to the audit point, and for us to come out and do that site survey, that's 500 pounds plus VAT. If you're then successful with the award and, and want to retain that over the course of the year, that's a 750 pound management fee for that year. Um, in saying that, that is our, um, our flat costing structure in line with the other UK providers at the moment, we are aware that that cost um, for some of the smaller establishments um, might be more difficult. So we are in active um, and very open conversations um, with um, destination uh, management operators around potentially um, different partnerships where we could look at reducing that cost for some of the smaller establishments that might be interested in Green Key. So if there is anyone interested in, uh, in that conversation on this call, happy to pick that up separately. I am, but uh, more information on the website on the costs front, folks. Thank you very much, Eva. And in the final two minutes, Alistair, it's to, to leave us on a positive. Frank has mentioned that sometimes this can be quite overwhelming in the, in the size and scale of the challenge. Um, but he has reminded us that Mr. Carney had said your green values will affect your value. So it can also be the small things that we do that Frank has reminded us just to sort of leave us on a high of everything that we do is hopefully impactful. Just your thoughts on that, Alistair, as we finish up. I think that's a great way to end. Thank you, Frank. And I think in a way it ties in with what I tried to say at the end, which is, you know, there's a <laughs> there's almost an existential imperative to act here. There's a financial, there's a legal, um, there's a market based imperative to act. But ultimately, what we're talking about here, I think, is about building a better world, <laughs> which has got to be a good thing. Um, and I think um, I think that's really helpful to have in the front of our minds. You know, we're talking about about, um, you know, better food and better health and stronger communities and better nature and, and, and better places to live and uh, and better places to visit. And uh, I know that's what gets a lot of people on this call out of bed in the mo in the morning. And it's, it's a great way to end. Thanks for reminding us of that, Frank. Thank you all so much. That's been a great conversation. And thanks to everyone who joined for, for taking your time out to come along and see us today.